This is the Weekly Set, the official podcast of TVEnthusiast.com. Episode 74, recorded September 15th, 2016. Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Weekly Set, the official podcast of TVEnthusiast.com. I am your host and editor-in-chief of TV Enthusiast. My name is Tyson Gifford, and joining me today, as always, is our keeper of comics here at TV Enthusiast, William Rorick. Hello. So today we're going to be talking about what we've been watching of the past week. Uh, we're also going to talk a little bit about Once Upon a Time, because I've been catching up on that. And I'm now actually ahead of Will on that series, and we just have an interesting topic about that to talk about. Uh, we'll be talking about uh, Peaky Blinders. We're finishing our show club tonight, and uh, we'll be announcing our picks for Advocates of Great Television for our 75th episode. Um, and I'll announce who's joining us for that as well. So let's get started with Once Upon a Time. So I've been watching this uh, since I think this summer, basically. Since like summer, you know, all, all the shows started going on a hiatus. It kind of became a background show for me to catch up on. And I've been going through all the way from season one. Um, I caught up a while ago and then the, la- the uh, most recent season dropped just uh, a couple weeks ago, I think. And I started started catching up on that. I'm actually just one episode behind finishing the season and being completely up to date on the series for the first time. But what I want to talk about with Once Upon a Time isn't so much the show itself, but kind of like the way people fall in and out of that show. And uh, when we've talked about the show before, uh, when Kat was on the show, she talked about how it just got too stupid for her. She stopped watching. Um, then she started watching it on Netflix, caught back up in time for season five the most recent season, and started watching that live, hit the same point again. Too stupid, can't watch us anymore. Mm -hmm. Um, Now, Will, you watched straight through until you got to the halfway point of season five, and then you were like, can't watch us anymore, too stupid. Yeah, pretty much. So, um, based on the fact that Kat kind of went through this process twice, and that you hit this process, and the fact that I've never watched the show live, I've never had it where I, where it wasn't available to binge to me, basically. Um, I started wondering, is this just a kind of show in which it's just, it's that right level of stupid where if you're binging it, if you're watching like, you know, an episode a day or something, for example, uh, it doesn't, you don't have time to dwell on how stupid something is. I mean, I don't, I, I watched, I watched from season three on onward live. Mm -hmm. Um, I didn't have any problems until I got up to that point. So I think maybe it's just, it was just a dumb storyline. Well, you, you had problems, you just not enough to make me quit. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Yes, yeah, true. Not enough to make me quit. <laughs> I'm I'm interested in seeing how I'm going to take it once I'm caught up and once the new season starts where I'm only watching one episode a week. And because to see if this little theory of mine holds any weight, my little control test subject here. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you have to you have to be your own guinea pig now. <laughs> yeah, to see what this is. But I can say so far, I didn't have as much of a disconnect as you did at, at the specific moment what you're talking about, which is the mid-season finale of season five. Um, I actually thought that where it picked up, it kind of answered some of the kind of things that really bothered like you and Kat, I think, about um, that moment. I think it kind of answered them fairly okay. Um, you know, not great because the show hasn't, doesn't really do anything super smart. <laughs> See, but, may, maybe it did, but so maybe like that kind of confirms your theory then. Because if mm-hmm. that happened, there was a gigantic wait between that episode and then the start of the second half. Like, yeah, that's when the show went on hiatus for several months. Yeah. And so if you know, you, you leave somebody stewing in that, you're, I, I don't, you know, I wasn't too excited to go pick the show back up when it came back after several months. Cause I was like, you know, because, you know, but yeah, if that was like, if it was on, another it, episode right away. Uh, yeah. If it was on Netflix, I could just watch the next episode. I might have been tempted even, even through 
even even through like my simmering disgust at what I just witnessed, I'd probably pick up the next episode just to see how it's addressed. Um, mm-hmm. But that didn't happen because you know they they and by by that time I moved on to other shows that I'm enjoying a lot more. You know, I'm constantly watching shows um, as anybody who <laughs> listens to these podcasts can attest. You know, I got yeah. way I got a lot to watch so if something's not working for me it means nothing to me to just drop it ain't got Um, no time for once upon a time when you got mr robot on your plate yeah exactly (laughs) (laughs) so it's like so so there's that factor too so i could see your point like yeah if if it was netflix and i could just watch next episode right away probably would have and maybe that episode would have been like made me say oh i can't stay mad at you but (laughs) because it is just kind of like i don't know i guess kind of soapy where you get just kind of addicted in the stories and and you realize that while you're watching it that this isn't great yeah Um, but you're just still just kind of like yeah but i'm just gonna keep watching and because i'm kind of hooked into the little stories and stuff um even though you acknowledge it's not that great there's, there's, there's another thing about that episode that like royally pissed me off too and it wasn't just like the hook emma stuff it was also the stuff with mr gold like they apparently like completely reset all character progression that he made yeah <laughs> that, I, I was like what why that that's still like they they did address that as well but still like it's just it's not satisfactory for me on that one at all. <laughs> um but yeah I, I i agree with you on that one it's just because plot they needed yeah. something to move the plot along you know Right. Because basically what they did was so kind of like um, such a final thing to do that like, well, you know, how are we going to address <laughs> what yeah. we just did and still have the series go on for multiple more seasons, you know? Yeah. Um, so they had to kind of uh, uh, do something like that, you know? And of course, they just want, you know, uh, uh, Robert Carlyle, the actor who plays Mr. Gold, Rumpelstiltskin on the series to be a villain because that's what he's really good at. Yeah, that's what he's really good at. Yeah, that's that's exactly what happened. But yeah, that was disappointing too. The interesting counterpoint to this, to the to what I'm talking about with the whole kind of format of the show, is that a, a long time ago, uh, my sister and I watched 24 season two over the span of 24 hours as like an she was writing an article for some like magazine or something about. Uh, um, you know, just kind of in taking on an interesting project and the idea of like comparing the mundane aspects of actually sitting around and getting some food and watching a show to what Jack Bauer is doing over the course of 24 hours. <laughs> and so she didn't want to do it by herself because, you know, you want 24 hours of watching a show by yourself gets a bit old. Uh, <laughs> it's hard, especially when you're trying to stay awake. Uh, so she asked me if I would watch it with her and I said, yeah, sure. And we watched it and and I really liked the first season of 24 and I couldn't stomach the way season two went. And to this day, I don't know if it's just because season two is that much worse or something than the show, or if it's because it's just so ridiculous when you cover like a character being kidnapped four times in one day. Yeah. When, when you watch it over a longer span, even if you're watching it on DVD and you're watching like, you know, one episode or four episodes a day or something, Thing, which is something we did with, I think, season three later on. But um, even if you're doing something along those lines, it's very different from watching 24 hours straight. And even though 24 is supposed to take place in the span of 24 hours, which is the whole point of this article my sister is writing, it, it just feels so much more ridiculous because you know, somewhere in your brain, you're, you're dividing it and you're saying, oh, you know, well, like, let's check back in as if like a day's passed since you've checked in with, with Jack Bauer. But it's not. It's, it's all in one day. And that's ridiculous when you actually take it in that context. Well, here's it. It's interesting you say that because I I did pick up 24 until the second season, mm-hmm. and I absolutely loved it. 
Of course, when I picked up 24, Netflix wasn't a thing, and I had to watch it week to week. Yeah. Um, yeah, because that's the only way it was available. Yeah. So, yeah, that just kind of, like, puts more evidence to what I thought, which is just that it's just you can't watch a show like that because it's it's not like this slow kind of like there's this terrorist event happening in one day. There's a ridiculous amount of stuff that happens in, in one of those days. And ridiculous is the right word because it's too much. Um, but when you're watching it week to week, it doesn't bother you. It's just when you're watching it back to back, it's like, okay, this is just too much. This is ridiculous. <laughs> yeah. Um, so this is kind of like the opposite of that with Once Upon a Time, where it's like you, you can kind of just get hooked into the kind of soapy stories if you just are binging it. But if you're watching it week to week, you, you have time to dwell on how stupid something is. It's kind of like if you've ever known somebody who watches so Soap operas. I mean, my mom and my sister both watched soap operas before in the past. When they get away from the soap opera for long enough for, for it to kind of get out of their system and they go back and try to watch it again, they can't because it's like too ridiculous. And they realize kind of how stupid the plots are and stuff. And because they're no longer hooked into the plots that are happening, they're not just carrying along with the story. They're, they're just done. Like right. I can't get back into this. And I'm wondering if that's the case to some extent with Once Upon a Time in which like in, if you're not binging the series, you're, it, it's hard to stay into it. You know, like every break, every week or, you know, like for you, it hit on that hiatus point where it it's like months where you didn't have a new episode. Every time you hit a point like that, it just makes it harder to get back in. Right. Yeah, exactly. So yeah. that's kind of all I wanted to talk about really with Once Upon a Time. I'm going to continue to watch the, the next season and see what happens on it. You said that you were considering watching the next season um, when we when we did the fall preview podcast. Yeah. Are you still thinking that? Or are you going to watch the last season? Or I don't know what I'm going to do. I, I, I am considering picking it back up. Okay, so we'll have to see what happens with that, and and we'll, we'll discuss like where we both are on that. We'll, point. we'll see what happens. We'll see what I'm watching at the time, and if I can fit in into my schedule or not. Uh, yeah, but I'm at the point where other things like cough, Luke Cage cough are going to take precedence. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Westworld as well. Is Westworld yeah. this fall? Westworld's this fall. It's uh, I think October second. Oh my God, Jesus! It's coming up. There's some reviews already coming out for it. it looks really good so i didn't realize it was that close because like this thing has been in development forever and the yeah. last and the last i heard of it was that development was still sort of a mess and i was like oh okay and then like hbo did run those new teasers but i still like had the idea that this was like kind of a far away thing yeah it, it's coming up it's coming up quick so this wow. is I'm definitely excited for that, and Luke Cage are both like... Oh, yeah, definitely, for sure. Really big ones for me. And Luke Cage has been getting, like, I think the first seven episodes, that's usually what Netflix does. They'll give out the first seven episodes to press early. Um, and I've been hearing a lot of people kind of in the TV critics press basically saying they think it's, like, the best of the Netflix Marvel shows. Oh, wow. That's so Nice. Too bad you can't be part of the pressing of those seven episodes. <laughs> Still don't have a contact with Netflix. If you're listening, hit me up. Ah, yeah. You're yeah. like right in our wheelhouse. We probably talk about Netflix more than anything else on this uh Exactly. Website. <laughs> so. This podcast is basically like, this website and podcast is basically free advertisement for Netflix. So come on. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. Uh, so yeah, uh, let's move on now. Uh, we're going to talk about Mr. Robots. So we're going to be talking about last week's episode of Mr. Robot, episode 2.8, which is actually the 10th episode of the season. But, you know, Mr. Robot has their really weird numbering system with their episodes. Uh, the episode is titled Hidden Process.axx. Yes. Um, yes, this episode was good. <laughs> uh, well, basically, there, there's not much to the episode, but it's the way the way the stuff that does play out. It's pretty amazing. There's like this. There's a shock ending to it. Yeah. Um, it's got all the elements of a great episode. Basically, what happens is is Elliot meets with I can't even think of names now. Um, that guy Tyrell Wellix, uh, his his widow, his wife. Yeah. His is uh, yeah. uh we think widow we're we, not we, sure we, we think widow we're not sure for the 
publicity's sake, we're going to say Widow. Yeah. Because as far as everybody knows in the show right now, Tyrell Wellick is dead. Like Elliot, that's even what genu- Elliot thinks, yeah. That's even what Elliot genuinely thinks. Um, She reveals to Elliot that she believes Tyrell is alive and that he's doing something that he has to do for her. Um, She doesn't know what it is, but she's been getting phone calls that she believes are is actually from Tyrell. Elliot's kind of blindsided because Elliot believes that he's dead. Um, and so Elliot immediately does, does, doesn't know where these calls are coming from. Mr. Robot cautions Elliot against doing anything for this woman because she is dangerous. And they she, could end she up dead. Easily gets into his head. She's there's 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 this crazy part like at the beginning of the episode where she's just staring at Elliot and Elliot is talking to the viewer and then Elliot says it's like then Elliot says something like like it's it's like she can see you talking to the viewer. Yeah. And and, and then Mr. Robot chimes in and says, I feel like she can see me. And then yeah. Mr. Robot, not Elliot, Mr. Robot starts walking away and she says she says something like stay stay here or so, or something yeah. like, back here like very creepy you know <laughs> <laughs> this is yeah what we talked about last week when we when we talked about how we were excited to see more between um Elliot and Joanna Wellek because the one scene they had together in the first season was just completely unnerving and all it was was the two of them talking there wasn't even anything really major they were talking about but it was entirely Entirely unnerving, and it was just the same this time too. So it just came across the same way. Um, Joanna's like bodyguard, hitman, assistant, whatever he is, uh, takes Elliot to try to to use Tyrell's phone to find out where he is. Right. Um, Um, Elliot, he's he's taking Elliot to his apartment, but Elliot tells him that the dummy, I was arrested, my apartment was raided, I don't have anything to do what you need me to do. We need to get to a micro center so I can get some gear. <laughs> He's like, I'm not Felicity. I don't just wave my fingers around and stuff happens. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Because I actually have to do real hacking here. I actually have to do real computer work here. So, so, so he takes him on a little shopping spree at Micro Center, buy all this expensive computer stuff, spend a shitload of money. Dude, I saw those prices. Uh, the comment <laughs> that that there's a discount for using a uh, special E Corp money. <laughs> <laughs> E Corp money is something that's been kind of coming up consistently through this season as like the the E coin, which is kind of like Bitcoin. Yeah, kind of like um, Bitcoin. Yeah. Which, which is interesting the way it plays into the whole kind of like almost post-apocalyptic vibe that the second season has after the whole like financial crash. You yeah. know, it's interesting how it's like kind of like fake currency kind of plays into that and stuff. So that is, I feel, going to be like a bigger thing going into the end of the season. Mr. Robot remarks that the e-coin is more justification for their mission. Um, you know, he remarks that. The, because Elliot's looking around at what, you know, the, the effects of what his hack had done and Elliot's expressing regret at what he did and, and expressing doubts about the mission. Um, you know, what has the mission wrought? And Mr. Robot, like, and then when Ellie gets into the store and he remarks on the e-coins, uh, Mr. Robot uses that to reiterate that their mission was just and this is the reason, this is one of the reasons why. Mm-hmm. Um, so that's interesting too, you know, that, that's, yeah. a, that's a small thing, but it, you know, it, it, it is actually a pretty significant thing. It plays into the bigger picture. It plays into the bigger picture, yeah. Um, in the middle of the store, Elliot gets a phone call from Joanna Wellick's phone that she gave Elliot, the phone that she received that she's getting these phone calls from that she wants Elliot to look into. Elliot has this phone on him and, and he gets a phone call from it and the caller doesn't do anything except breathe and it kind of freaks Elliot out. And then after Elliot hangs up, he noticed Mr. Robot is gone. He completely disappears from the picture. 
And it's interesting because from that moment on, Mr. Robot doesn't appear in the episode at all. Yeah. He's, he's just gone, you know, like, like that spooked the hell out of him for some reason. Yeah, definitely. And then, um, they're back at Elliot's apartment and he ends up locating, figuring out where, uh, the phone is that was calling Joanna Wellick's phone. Yeah. And immediately Joanna's guard, bodyguard, assistant, hitman, whatever. Oh, let's just call him manservant. He just starts. <laughs> confiding in like Elliot like telling Elliot these stories and Elliot's like like is he suddenly gonna try and have a heart to heart with me it's like I don't <laughs> and then he's like talking about his method for for uh, um for zoning out and not paying attention to him. yeah <laughs> it's uh, Elliot's lessons in, in pretending not to hear somebody or like zoning out and... zoning out and not yeah pretending not to hear about something which was really funny but then and um, he sees the location of where Tyrell Wellick supposedly is and immediately knows where that location is. Yeah. And says, basically, it's like, this is not good. You know, like, is kind of concerned. Elliot's like, has no idea what this location is that this, that, that this guy's referring to. But he's like, what is this? Where is this? You know where this is? And the guy's like, it's not good. Uh, it's being cryptic. He takes off. Um, Elliot ends up getting a call from uh, um, Angela. Yeah, and, but Angela is actually texting, you know, like texting yeah. and saying, like, this is urgent, urgent, I need you. you know, multiple shot, times, yeah, you know, while multiple he's doing times this. While he's doing this. Um, after, after he finds the location of the phone calls, um, which, which, the, which he uses, it's pretty ingenious he uses it. It's not magic. He doesn't use it by, you know, the TV way, by like, it. <laughs> soliciting it, by hacking the police database, you know, like hacking into their computers. No, he he does it through manipulation. You know, he 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 just uh he just contacts the fo- the phone carrier pretending to be the police. You know, he just goes onto their website. He hacks into their website, downloads an official looking form, fills it out in his name with a badge scans number. Scans it back in, yeah. Scans it back in and sends it to the phone service provider pretending to be the police himself to get access to that information. And gives a plausible reasoning saying that he got a call, they think that the person's going to hurt themselves, but they're not sure if it's just like a prank or something. Basically making it real believable. Like this, you know, if he, if he plays it up too urgent, then alarm bells go off. And if he plays it up too soft, then they're not going to do it. But the idea like this guy might hurt himself. I just need to do my job, lady. Come on, give me my information. It works. It works. It's, the yeah. social engineering works and he gets it. But after that, he meets up with Angela. They're on a subway car together. Angela pretty much knows everything about Elliot's involvement and, you know, outside of, I guess, the full scope of his insanity. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I, th- I, I, she, she doesn't know, I guess she doesn't know the full scope, but she knows some of it. Yeah. She, she, she knows, knows he's seeing his dad. She, yeah. She knows she's seeing his dad and that, and that maybe, 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 uh, she knows she, he's seeing his dad and that that's influencing him. Mm-hmm. And so I should, that, I think that's about what she knows. Yeah. So, uh, she has a heart to heart with Elliot. It's like kind of like the first moment really since season one that they've talked. Right. And it's kind of like a real big heart to heart. They have a similar moment to what happened in like the first episode of this entire series where it looked like they were right on the verge, like really close to each other, like they were going to kiss and they didn't. Yeah, they didn't. And, and this time they did. This time they did. It's been known since the beginning of the show that uh Elliot has had an unrequited crush on her. Mm-hmm. Um and this in this moment Elliot decides to act on those emotions and she she reciprocates. Yeah. Yeah. And uh she's basically this is them like bad timing is their parting ways. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Because she's basically going to go to her attorney, say everything that's going on, admit her part, but leave out Elliot and Darlene and everybody else. 
um, but admit her part in everything that happened because she just can't deal with it anymore. Um, and then you have a very like fight club moment in which Elliot gets off the subway and you see her staying on the subway, but then you see some figures closing in on her. Yeah. Like immediately after, which just reminds me a lot of in fight club, the scene where he sent, uh, Marla Singer off on the bus and yeah. then you see the figures on the bus rise up and start walking towards her. Yeah. Um, which is like a real kind of like subtle moment where it's like, Oh wait, somebody's, you know, and they don't play it up like, Oh, this is a dramatic moment oh my god you know it's it's very just kind of like it happens if you're not paying attention you don't notice um but yeah so they did that so you're like okay so somebody has angela now you don't know who it is but somebody clearly is like jumped in on this um and that brings us to kind of the the b plot of the episode which is brings us to the ending of the episode too which is that in the last episode, um, Elliot's uh, boyfriend uh, um, had found, or not Elliot's boyfriend, I say, Darlene's boyfriend had found uh, uh, yeah. one of the people from F Society basically all just messed up in uh, the old apartment, had brought him back to their place, and they had decided they needed to take him to the hospital. Well, he had decided. Uh, yeah. Darlene had other ideas, like, just let him die because it's, you know, she, she, she is feeling extra sociopathic <laughs> ever since she ever since she killed a woman. Um, so, you know, Darlene's like kind of turning into a, like this huge sociopath. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but she ends up deciding that, yeah, uh, we should take him to the hospital. Right. Uh, which turns out to have been a very bad idea. Well, uh, <laughs> well, the FBI, the FBI gets the identity of, of, uh, Darlene's boyfriend. I, I guess not as based name, on a sketch. Yeah. Based on a sketch, you know, which, uh, which the one FBI agent there uh, pleads with her boss not to not to disseminate because they don't want to spook the guy. They they want to catch him without him like seeing it coming. Uh, but you know, not just that, but it puts him in grave danger. Yeah, it puts and him they in, need him alive. Well, that's they want, true. They wanna... Yeah, they need him alive. It puts him in grave danger from uh. But Dark you know, Army. the FBI is kind of stupid, or at least <laughs> at least the boss like, is kind of an idiot, and he's like it's like nah. I'm just gonna we're just gonna put it out on the news because YOLO <laughs> I do, his reasoning kind of sucked actually uh, he's just to me he just rings as a uh, he's just like a company man he's just doing what you know following the procedure of the you know not really thinking not wanting to make waves basically yeah pretty much and she's like you have to think outside the box a little here <laughs> this is the situation and he's not willing to take that so he they just they put it out she's desperately hunting for him somebody at the hospital recognized him yeah but they uh, left they they left to get dinner so they didn't even see the notice so they didn't even see the notice they don't know anybody's coming after them they're just eating at this diner you know wasting away like i think like two hours she said mm -hmm. so they're wasting away two hours you know until they go back to the hospital um is what they're basically doing and you know and it's kind of funny because you know it shows darlene and her boyfriend they're kind of bonding in that diner mm -hmm. a little bit uh she 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 goes the fbi agent leaves the hospital to go looking for them she realizing that they're at some restaurant nearby realizing that yeah that they're at some restaurant nearby she finds the diner now here's this is interesting because because as when she when she approaches the diner and she goes in the shot stays fixed on the exterior shot of the diner yeah it stays wide as it stays wide down. and yeah. stays fixed as she goes inside and as a viewer you don't know what happened you don't even know if they're still in that diner at that point yeah if she, if she missed them or you know if she caught them it doesn't seem to matter anyway because as soon as she enters that diner the this these gunmen pull up on a motorcycle uh, on a motorcycle they shoot shoots the place up she uh the cop she shoots the guy i think the cops show up they shoot the guy dead he shoots uh, himself he, oh he shoots himself yeah that's it's, right. it's like before like when the fbi office was uh shot up oh that's where right. the, the shooters killed themselves the shooters when they killed themselves yeah the other guy actually drives away yeah um the other guy gets away 
She, again, the FBI agent, she runs out of there. She's got blood on her, but it looks like she escaped that with her life. Yeah. Um, that was crazy. Yeah. That was clearly the Dark Army, like, trying to take out Darlene and her boyfriend. Or maybe they were trailing the FBI, or maybe, like, that was an attempt to take out that agent. I don't know. What's interesting is there was a scene earlier in the season in which uh, Darlene's boyfriend uh, was basically being kind of like slightly tortured by the Dark Army. Oh, like yeah. it wasn't overplayed. Um, and it seems now that maybe they planted like a tracking device inside him. Oh, uh, like like the kind that you'd put inside wild animals. I, you know, I, don't, track. Know, I don't know if they did that because it just seemed they like they found him quickly. It, they did find him quickly because it seemed like what they did earlier, they played off as torture because the guy just stuck a needle in in his finger and broke it off in there, which would be painful as hell. Yeah. It painful. It looked, it, so it looked like it was just simple torture. I think they put in a tracking device and that was yeah. hidden under the guise of torture. Oh, maybe, yeah. Um, because they, tracking devices are tiny. They put them in animals all the time. You know, they uh, catch wild animals and put trackers in them and let them release them so they can track their you know uh, uh their 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 patterns where they move and stuff uh i think that's basically what they did they uh, put a tracker in them that's where the episode ends and we still don't know if darlene and her boyfriend were still in that diner if they're alive what you their can't status. tell because of the far out shot and, and yeah you can't tell because of the far out shot so we don't know what their status is now as this episode ends we don't know um we have no clue what happened uh there there's mm-hmm. also one more thing worth knowing with this episode and that's the beginning of the episode where uh thomas dolby dolby uh the the one guy uh from the first season that that elliot sold out uh and the ceo of e corp yeah 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 uh the the not the C- ceo the um the, the former CTO. Yeah, the uh, former CTO. And, and he's the, talking to and yeah, and he's talking to the CEO. And and he, you know, they're talking and they're they're talking about this insane plan to, you know, like to get to get Obama to to basically let the Chinese take take over the Congo. Um, you know, uh <laughs> and basic, you know, basically, you know, that's kind of the game they're playing. Um, and I don't know if like this is part of the Dark Army's plan or, you know, I I know it has to be related something to the Dark Army, you know, because we saw the CEO of E Corp talking to the head of the Dark Army the last episode, you know. But he's got his own plans contrary to the guy from the Dark Army. Like he's kind of out to uh, to to basically kill off that guy just as that guy is off to kill off him. You know? Yeah, he's out to kill off him. They're kind of like in this weird civil war with each other. They're like at yeah. war with each other, but at the same time they're like working together on yeah. some other things. Yeah, at the same time they're working together on some other things. And then the others, yeah, they're, they're at war. Um, So we don't know what this Congo thing has to do with anything. Um, it, it makes more sense when you realize who's pushing for it, you know, CEO of E Corp. Yeah. <laughs> so, but, yeah, Mr. Robot continues to be like but, a very but, cerebral but show. Did, but no, no, you're getting ahead of yourself here. Okay. Because I didn't even get to a point. I was trying to, because what he does is he, he, the CTO, the former CTO asks him, why do you do this? Why do you do what you do? And then he gives this like insane speech, like this insane megalomaniac speech. He's yeah. like, he's like, <laughs> <laughs> he's like well you see as i was making my way in the world i asked myself a question and that question always was am i the most powerful person in the room <laughs> <laughs> and 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 then he ends caps it, uh, it caps off by saying well, well for the most part yes except for like in two or three instances well, that's gonna change and then he says something like my goal my goal or my end game is like second only to God creating the earth. <laughs> <laughs> Which works perfectly from his like the operatic performance that he always gives. Yeah, the operatic performance he always gives. So like this guy is like a complete psycho. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, proving it again, you know, like he's he's been great on screen. Uh, um he was great last episode in this confrontation with uh, uh, uh um with uh, the the finance minister of china or whatever <laughs> white rose mm-hmm. uh he had a great scene with him so yeah it's 
he's he's one of those characters that pops every time he's on screen. So looking forward to more from him <laughs> in his Megalomania. Um, but yeah, um, Mr. Robot just continues to be an incredibly cerebral show. This is like, you know, now that Hannibal's gone, this is my Hannibal replacement, I guess, <laughs> of like a super cerebral show. Yeah, like super cerebral show, yeah. Um, let's move on now. Let's talk about Brain Dead, Season 1, Episode 11, titled Six Points on the New Congressional Budget, The False Dichotomy of Adultery, no, not Adultery, <laughs> of Austerity versus Expansionary Pulse. Yeah. Adultery. <laughs> well, there was adultery. Well, there was adultery. Yes, uh, that, that was brought up this episode. Uh, this episode was pretty fun. Uh, basic, ba- uh, basically, Laurel's brother gets noticed that he is he is a candidate to be the head of the CIA should the Democrats win the election. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, the transit the transition team visits him and says, you know, hey, we want you to head up the CIA, which means you know, they have to vet him. Which means they have to vet him. So they're going through this vetting process and that means going through all of his mistresses <laughs> and and that proves to be a speed bump. Everything seems to be going good until the subject of Laurel's bug obsession kind of comes up. It's great how she plays <laughs> it off like, uh, I, it's just a metaphor. <laughs> yeah, it's just a metaphor, right? She gets extra, like, you notice how, like, she also, like, gets extra dressed up as, like, a hippie and, like, overpresents herself as a sort of hippie-style artist when she's, like, giving mm-hmm. that explanation, you know? <laughs> she, 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 like, really Really plays up like sort of being like this eccentric artist or something yeah for them when she's like saying oh it's a metaphor all artists have metaphors you know? <laughs> <laughs> i like that touch <laughs> we got to see finally in this episode where um gareth <laughs> got to see kind of like the bugs firsthand yeah gareth actually <laughs> saw a bug come out of his boss's head and then his boss like pick it up and let it cross back into his head <laughs> which was hilarious watching gareth deal with that <laughs> yeah. after everything like uh, um that uh, uh you know had been said before with laurel and everything it, it's like <laughs> him just kind of like trying to like wrap his head around it great it was uh, great uh so they get together laurel uh they finally they they finally hatch a plan uh to to stop the bugs once and for all they determine that the bug in red's uh head must be the queen and if they kill the queen they can ki- they can possibly kill the rest of them and the invasion um so 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 they figure out so they devise a plan to get the bug out of his head and kill it. Um, it almost, it almost works. Almost. Except for Red's intern at the pivotal moment comes in and thwart, and thwarts that, that attempt. Yeah. Um, the, it's a struggle. It's insane. Uh, the, the bug is injured. The bug is injured, but it's not dead. They don't manage to kill it. It manages to get back into Red's head and, and it looks in and their attempt fails. Um, around this time around this time the the head of the head of the cia the guy behind the scenes i guess um calls laurel's brother to a meeting and like explains everything to him in the plainest details like oh hey by the way there are bugs they're getting in people's heads they're eating their brains they're taking control uh they're taking control of them and changing the way people behave like everything down to the whole nine yards just like in plain english except he says don't bother getting involved we're taking care of it and actually your sister kind of ruined an operation we already had going so tell her to stay out of it too uh again now and and we think, oh, okay, weird. And then the, he's thinking <laughs> weird too. You know, he doesn't know how. Yeah, to he's got the, kind of like the same reaction that uh, um, that uh, Gareth has been having. Yeah. <laughs> he doesn't quite know how to process any of that. <laughs> you know, yeah. he, he does. He's like, what? <laughs> and, and then, and then after he leaves, we see Red come out um, and t- and says, you know, you think he bought it? <laughs> so yeah. Uh, so this head of the head is actually one of the bugs as well. It's actually infected. 
poorly infected as well. Um, uh, there's another story going on through this episode, which is that Red tried to push this new bill, this massive budget bill. Yep, this magic massive budget, which they which they they're combing through so much just to find out what's hidden in that budget. Thanks to Gareth, massive. they find out that there's like these massive amount of revisions that took place in one section of the bill, and he ends the up telling farm, Laurel and yeah, the, the farm, farm bill. bill. Yeah, it's like why the farm bill? So and, then they're like their head nerd, their legal ease nerd that goes through contracts and stuff is basically like having an existential crisis going through this contract. <laughs> like falling in love with it or something <laughs> yeah. like how masterfully it's written or something you know <laughs> and he's getting into the farm bill and talking about these like structures and um how they're built up and everything and and they end up figuring out that these are the structures that uh laurel and her group had originally thought were um internment camps Yes. Uh, it's in several episodes before that this is directly related to them. Um, so now they're like, okay, they kind of have an idea about one of, uh, about the, the plans for the bugs, what they're trying to do. They don't really know what they're trying to do, but they, they have their lead into figuring that out. Um, what they're doing. <laughs> and so, is there anything else to talk about from Brain Dead from this episode? Um, I think that covers it. So, there's two episodes left of Brain Dead. They aired back to back as a two part finale. I've already seen it. So, uh, I, I look forward to talking to you about it, but we're not going to talk about it next week. So, maybe the week after we'll try to figure that out, uh, when we yeah. talk about it. But, uh, let's move on. Let's talk about Peaky Blinders. This is the end of our show club so we've made it through all 18 episodes of uh peaky blinders that are currently available there are i think another two seasons that have been ordered already um uh but they're not going to be out for a while and we'll probably not discuss them in the same way we have here like episode by episode because they're going to release on netflix so we'll probably just talk about the whole season as a whole at some point later on on the podcast um but this is the final episode of season three season three episode six um, in which we really get to just utterly despise and loathe Father Hughes even more than we could before. <laughs> yeah, Some, somehow much. they created a villain worse than Chester Campbell. Oh yeah, they created yeah, this guy is much Chester ha- Campbell. Uh, for as bad as he was, he always seemed like he always came across as kind of goofy. He didn't come across as like the threat that he fashioned himself out to be. Like, like, mm-hmm. like you know that he in his mind thought he was. He always seemed like kind of yeah he always seemed like kind of impotent in a way yeah um where this this guy was genuinely scary um so it kind of kicks off this episode kicks off with they're at the um grace shelby institute for children is being opened up and so they have this big <laughs> party orphanage yeah. yeah and uh, um uh, uh tommy ends up encountering father hughes there who's basically saying yes i'm gonna take this one office over there for private meetings with you know young boys boys <laughs> yeah basically i'm gonna molest children and under your roof of under your institute your roof of, of your institute of your orphanage yeah uh-huh. and there's nothing you can do about it then tommy goes back in he's having to kind of suffer through dealing with all these people that want to talk to him and do photo ops and stuff um and through that he gets basically tricked into a complicated situation where he has to hand his son off to somebody. Yeah. And that ends up being a horrible mistake because his son is abducted. And the Peaky Blinders go into, like, just panic mode, and they're, like, all over the place trying to find out what happened, and they realize that he's gone. So Charlie's gone. Uh, Uh, Pretty soon after the abduction... Father Hughes gets in touch with Tommy and confirms that yes, yes, he's behind the abduction and he has Tommy's son and and he also, Father Hughes also reveals that he knows all about everything Tommy was planning to do and that if he does, if Tommy doesn't do things the way Father Hughes wants, then he will kill his son. 
And it's not even just the way he wanted it done before. It's like, no, we're going to this with eyes open. Yes, you're going to take people and have them die on this train. And you're going to, yes, you're going to still rob that place of all of its jewels, but we're taking all of them. Uh, and like, you're not getting any of them. And you're just going to take it like a bitch, basically, is what Father Hughes is saying. Like, this is your only hope. You have nothing else. It's basically, you know, horrendous horrendously like fucking with Tommy. Yeah. Uh, so Tommy get, goes back to his house. He starts lashing out at his family because clearly there's a leak here where information got out. And he's like, how the fuck did this get out? Was this, you know, Esma? Was this uh, Arthur's like born again wife? Was this, you know, Polly and her painter boyfriend? He ends up kind of coming to the conclusion that could be one of two things. Uh, and he tells this to Polly that it's either Polly's painter boyfriend or it's something else, which he doesn't disclose to her. Uh, so then we find out that it was, in fact, not Tommy, uh, uh, Polly's painter boyfriend, um, but it was actually Alfie yeah, that, that sold out Tommy. Sold Tommy, out. Tommy has a meeting with Alfie basically to look for people that would buy a Fabergé egg because part of the whole thing when they said that they were going to steal all of the, they were going to take all the gems that Tommy was going to steal and sell all the, all the jewels was that the Fabergé egg was going to go to a specific person that wanted to impress his wife with it. Right. And uh, by using that information and reaching out to Alfie, Tommy has Alfie figure out like who this seller would be as a way of figuring out where his son's going to be and everything that's going on with this plan. Basically, he found the weak link in Father Hughes's whole situation and needs Alfie to help confirm that. What Alfie doesn't know is that Tommy already got access to basically the same information he's asking for from Alfie and is using it to figure out if Alfie is the leak to see if he's hiding one of the names off of the list, which he is. Yep. So he immediately draws a gun on um, Alfie. Alfie's got one of his men with him, so they get their guns back on him. Real heated confrontation. Michael was with Tommy, though, and he comes out and kills uh, uh, Alfie's yeah, man. Basically, basically, as soon as Tommy pulls a gun on Alfie, Alfie spills, um, admits to being the leak, admits admits to everything. Says just, he knew everything, you know, like, did you know about, you know, that they took my son? He's all, of course I knew. All this other stuff, you know, like going on basically and defending his position, not saying I didn't do anything, but saying, you know, if you're going to kill me, then kill me like a man and stop trying to pretend that everything's not fair game. And uh Tommy ends up deciding not to kill him. And at that moment, then uh, um Alfie reveals that he did not know that they had taken Tommy's son. And Tommy says, I know, I saw it. Meaning he saw it like in his face. Right. That he didn't know about that aspect of it. Um, so they go their own ways peacefully. Um, Tommy is now working on a way to disrupt Father Hughes's plan, but he has to set up just in case they have to set up this accident to happen still. Yeah, so basically um, the accident is going to happen if if Tommy can't stop Father Hughes in time. If they can't know. if they can't get his son back in time, then the accident will happen basically. So, yeah, basically uh, because Tommy's not taking any chances. He wants to get his son back alive. So they dead. basically divide into three parties. Uh, Tommy goes with his uh, um, trench digging friends from the army to, to expedite the jewel theft. Yes. They're going to do it like right away, very quickly, dangerously, because the Thames is right over them, which is just a huge river, uh, is right over the top of them. So very dangerously going to go through and try to get the jewels out. Um, at the same time, Michael is going to go after uh, Father Hughes and try to find Charlie. Yes. And his goal is he has to kill Father Hughes, secure Charlie, and then contact Finn, who is with John and Arthur, who've rigged the train to blow up. Yes. And basically the idea is, you know, kill the father identify the son, contact Finn. Finn runs to where John and Arthur are and tells them, no, don't blow up the train. Uh, Michael, though, isn't able to kill him right off the bat. He's he's reluctant. He, he has a, a hard time getting himself to actually pull the trigger. Because of this, the father takes advantage and starts attacking him, spewing all sorts of vile things towards yeah, him. Yeah. 
Yeah, just awful things. Uh, Michael ends up winning still because he has a knife on him and pulls that out and ends up, you know, cutting into Father Hughes' throat with it. Um, so he does end up killing him, but because of the struggle, because he wasn't able to kill him very quickly, uh, Finn is just seconds too late in reaching Arthur and John, and they end up blowing up the train anyways. Yep, they end up blowing up train, killing six people anyways. That's the sad part. Um, uh, while they're dealing with this fallout, uh, the episode kind of ends on this crazy note. Well, well, first off, Thomas meets with, uh, that Russian princess. The duchess or whatever. The duchess or whatever, the crazy person. Yeah, the psychotic. <laughs> uh, yeah, actually psychotic. Um, she, she has an appraiser with her. He, he brings, he gives her the jewels and stuff that he stole. And she says, well, it's not really stealing. These, these were, these belong to my family anyway. Um, mm. you know, she, she says something that she's got an appraiser there appraising all the jewels. Basically to say, hey, you know, basically to tell her if they're legit or not. Mm -hmm. Uh, you know, she, <laughs> she, she demands 5,000 pounds from Thomas for the sex. Um, and another for helping him get uh, over his wife. Yeah, another for helping him get over his wife. And then, uh, Thomas gives her the money for the sex. But, but when she says, when she asks for the extra 5,000 for helping him get over his wife, he closes the briefcase, takes it in his hand, and he says, you, you weren't even, not even close. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, then yeah. Tommy starts walking away, and bam! <laughs> yeah, he hears the gunshot. She she kills her appraiser that she brought. Tommy pulls out his she's gun. Just loony. Yeah, she's just loony. Tommy pulls out his gun, and she she tells him to hit her up. <laughs> you know? Yeah, hit me up if you're in where is it Vienna? Yeah, Vienna. Yeah, hit me up if you're in Vienna. It's like you're insane. Why would I do that? <laughs> no. I don't think so. <laughs> so Tommy leaves there a little shaken a little by just shaken. this crazy ass woman. Um, um, it ends in a pretty crazy way because he gets the family together and he's handing out money and everything. Handing out extra for, you know, accusing, unjustly accusing some of them and for the kind of different stresses he put them under. So he's giving them extra money for that. Um, and, and he's that, very nihilistic about it. He's very nihilistic. And then he drops a bombshell. And he drops a bombshell that, oh, and uh, by the way, uh, you're, the police are coming. You're wanted for blowing up the train and killing people. Oh, and you're wanted for the same thing. And, and you know, and his aunt, she's... And he's like, oh, and you're wanted for killing Chester Campbell, and you're all being arrested. Uh, but <laughs> and you're all being arrested right now. And then he's like, oh, but don't worry, I I got a plan. Um, I made I made a deal with somebody uh, even more powerful, somebody more powerful than our enemies. He doesn't expand on these plans or anything, and he just kind of sits there while everybody is arrested around him cursing it, him yeah <laughs> cursing him you know like just hating his guts like like he betrayed everybody um and then the it ends you know with with everybody's hauled away and he's just in the house by himself it's this kind of, it, he he he's alone and then he leaves the frame and then that's where the episode ends and it that's pretty crazy ending to the episode i thought it's like oh yeah so he's basically to some extent betrayed his whole family um at least in their eyes in his eyes like this was going to inevitably come back on them and there was nothing he could do so he made a deal with somebody more powerful we don't know the full details of this this is going to be probably the major points of the plot for next season uh and to kind of basically they have to be processed but they'll be let back out basically is his plan and yeah it's just a matter to, to them he's betrayed them all yeah and that's how it ends that's peaky blinders season three episode six episode 18 of the series as a whole the last episode of our show club so this is normally when i'd say if you want to watch along with us <laughs> but that's that's fast <laughs> yep uh if you want to watch the show, though, it is you on can, Netflix. It is on Netflix. You can watch it, you know. Just not along with us. You can go back and watch well, the episodes. Well, I mean, you, you can watch it with us if you go back and watch the episodes and then watch previous listen to previous episodes of this podcast. Yeah, uh, they're, they're not going to be all, if you do get the podcast on um, through like a podcasting 
same client. Uh, it only stores like the three most recent or two most recent episodes of the podcast, but all of our podcast episodes all the way back to the first are available on YouTube on our YouTube channel. That's just, it's just a matter of space requirements of what we're allowed in certain areas. And, but, uh, YouTube doesn't limit us. So they're all there. Um, you can go back and listen to the very, from the very beginning. You can watch Twin Peaks along with us. No, I, that, that's actually in our text. That was before that's, we that's, had the podcast. Yeah, that, that's in text. But that's still available. If you go to our website and go to the weekly set section at the top of the page, there's actually links to all of those going all the way back to the beginning of the weekly set as a text roundtable. No. So you could even do that if you wanted. <laughs> uh, but yeah, that brings us to an end of the show club. We'll do in our show club. At some point, we did this one. We kind of were doing it before we this, even called this it was a show. Kind of, this was kind of spontaneous. This was kind of born out of. We didn't have anything to watch. We didn't have any content. Yeah, we didn't have anything to watch. There was no content for the. So we had to like kind of scramble and find something to make. We something hit a happen. week where we literally had nothing to talk about, and we said, "Okay, we need to do something." <laughs> we yeah, need to do something. So who knows? Who I mean, who knows when in our show club is going to happen? I. Kind of like I kind of tend to believe t- these things happen spontaneously, so we'll see. I can imagine us doing it again, maybe next summer when you hit one of those lulls again where there's just nothing on. Yeah, uh, yeah. but it depends, you know. I mean, summer is filling out more and more every year, so who knows? Who knows? What next summer yeah. is going to be like. I, I guess. I guess it depends on what our viewing schedule is like. Yep. Uh, so we're going to end the podcast by talking about next week. So next week is our 75th podcast. Wow. So, yeah. <laughs> we've actually done more than that if you count like the different specials we've done and stuff like that as well. But this is our 75th numbered podcast of the weekly set. Uh, and for that, we're going to be doing a round of Advocates of Great Television. If you have never listened to our show or, you know, read the show when it was back, when it used to be a round table, Advocates of Great Television is an event where we get together, we pick, we each pick a show to be an advocate for and a specific episode of that show to represent it. Uh, we announce all of the, the titles that are available there. And then we go about watching all these episodes and then we return back the next week and we talk about what we saw. So we're going to be doing this next week. So we have our picks and it's also time we're going to announce that our guest for next week's podcast is going to be Lee Swiffa who uh, has written for the site before. She used to be on the podcast and she's going to be appearing again for the 75th episode. And here are our picks. Uh, my pick is Xena Warrior Princess season three, episode 12 titled the bitter sweet. It's the uh, musical episode of Xena. No. Nice. Um, okay. I, re- I, I remember <laughs> this one. <laughs> yeah. uh, Lee's pick is charmed season five episodes one and two. That's like a two part episode. It's listed as one episode on Netflix uh, titled a witch's tale. And so we're going to try our best to watch through, Um, I'll probably watch both episodes. I don't know time-wise if we're all going to be able to watch both of them. But we're going to be talking at least about the first episode of that two-part special. And Will's pick is Amazing Stories, Season 1, Episode 10, Remote Control Man. So the episode that uh, I picked and that Lee picked are both on Netflix. Will's pick is on NBC.com, right? Yes. And you said it's expiring on the 18th? Yeah, the 18th of this month. So like in like two days. Yeah, if you want to watch along with us, you got to get to that quick or find some other means of watching that. Yeah, sorry, like... Yeah, NBC's fault. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I'm gonna look and see if it's available on anything else, or if it's gonna become available on anything else. I after could that. not. I could not find it on anything else. To be honest, I'm gonna. I'm gonna yeah. try. I'm gonna do a little bit of looking when I put up the story for the podcast. If I find anything, I'll put that in the story to help direct you guys to it. <laughs> um, but yeah, those are the three things: Xena Warrior Princess season three, episode twelve, The Bittersweet Charm season five, episode one, A Witch's Tale. <laughs> And Amazing Story Season 1, Episode 10, Remote Control Man. Uh, So join us next week for the 75th podcast when we get together to discuss those three episodes.
Until then, thank you everybody for listening. Uh, I am Tyson Gifford. You can reach me on Twitter at Tyson Gifford. Will, you can reach on Twitter at Voxel Hero. And you can reach us in our comment sections of our stories, on the comments on the YouTube, anywhere that you can leave a comment related to what we're doing. We'll, we'll see it and, and address it. Uh, so yeah, thank you for listening. Night. Night. If you would like to voice your opinion, send an email to theweeklyset at tventhusiast.com. TV Enthusiast is a part of the Enthusiast Media Network. Stay tuned to TV Enthusiast and the Weekly Set Podcast for more coverage of all of your favorite